Hallelujah and blessings in King Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Be Ye Holy Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say with hearts of cheers and joy and praise, Hallelujah. Well, friends, brothers and sisters in Jesus, it is so good to be back with you. I apologize that it's been just a little while since we put out our last video. I went on vacation, if you would call it that, for two weeks up to see my parents. And that's the first time I've done anything like that in my entire life. Now, a little over 30 years ago, I had went on some vacations that were about a week long, but that was the first time I ever took that much time away, and the rest was really good. The time with my parents and my brother was really good. I got to see some old brothers and sisters in Christ that I love dearly, and so it was a joyous experience. But we are back, and as we are back, obviously it's winter time, but I trust that it is summer in your soul, that the light of Jesus is beaming in your heart and that you're walking in the joy and the peace and the fullness of the Holy Spirit each and every day, spending much time in his fellowship through prayer and through reading and studying of his word. I trust you are doing that. And if you are, you are growing to be more and more like him each and every day because you can't read the Bible, truly read the Bible and allow it to read you without being transformed. And the only way that we're not being conformed into the image of Jesus is if we're not spending time in his word. So I trust you're growing in the Lord Jesus each and every day and that your heart is being made ready so that when you meet him, you will stand before him confident and unashamed, knowing that, yes, you are a sinner saved by his grace and mercy, but you're doing all you can in this life to bring him pleasure each and every day. I trust that's your testimony. Well, we're continuing our reading in the book, Watchman Nee, Love Not the World. And I really hope that you have been a part of this series and the series that went before it, uh, The Road to Calvary, Humility, and other such books that we've read in order to prepare our hearts and our minds for the truth that is contained within this book. Because we know James chapter 4 verse 4 tells us, he who loves this world, who is attached to this world, is an enemy of God. And we don't want to be God's enemies, we want to be God's friends. And that's what we're learning in this book, how exactly we are to live in this world, but not to be of this world. And so today we're in chapter 10, and there's only 11 chapters in this book. So we're about to finish this book. And once we finish this book, we're going to do, as I promised, we're going to step into another book by Watchman Nee. And as I stated, if you've been in this series with us, then you'll know that there has been a step-by-step -step process as we've went through each one of these books that brings our hearts and our minds to be ready for the next level of, of spiritual maturity. And that's why we're going to look at a book called The Spiritual Man by Watchman Nee. Now, I introduced this book probably about six months ago, maybe a little longer, so many of you have probably already picked this up through christianbook.com or amazon.com or maybe other places. And so you'll be able to follow with us as we move through this book. Now, one thing I'm going to do as we move into this book, The Spiritual Man, is I'm no, I'm no longer going to block my face, but I wanna be able to read this book and as we read it to stop and discuss certain matters. So some of you have explained to me that you sometimes find it hard because you're watching the video and when it clicks over to that permanent screen when we're reading a book, you miss the fact of being able to see me in a presentation form. 
I apologize for that. I just didn't think that you would want to sit here and watch me read from a book to you. So that's why I put the still screen on so that it would make it easier for you to listen. And you can listen when you're doing dishes. You can listen when you're maybe picking up your bedroom or making the bed or brushing your teeth. There's there's many ways that you can listen to these series that we've done through these books and you don't have to be glued to the screen. So I felt that might be a little bit easier for you. But based upon some of your responses, uh, I'm going to change that in the next book, both for that reason and the fact that I'm going to be stopping throughout the chapter and we're going to be discussing some of these issues because some of these things that we're going to tackle in this next book are going to be very hard for us. And so it's important that we take the time to stop and discuss and work through some of these issues so that we can come to a place where not only we understand and we agree with what it is our teacher is going to be teaching us, but we're capable and ready to become doers of what it is we're hearing in disciplining our hearts, disciplining our thoughts, disciplining the things that we see around us and the way we act and respond to the things around us so that we can become true disciples of the Lord Jesus. And it's, it, it, it's interesting because disciples is short for discipline. So we want to become disciplined followers of the Lord Jesus in every area of our lives. And that's how holiness becomes a lifestyle. Well, with all of that being said, let's jump straight into the book, uh, Watchman Nee, Love Not the World, Chapter 10. And today, Chapter 10 is entitled, The Powers of the Age to Come. Now, the still screen is going to be next. So if you would like to set your phone down or walk away from your computer, turn your speakers up and maybe do something while you're listening, I certainly would encourage you to do that. Kill two birds with one stone, with, with one stone so to speak, right? So chapter 10, the powers of the age to come. May the Lord Jesus bless you and may the Holy Spirit open your mind as we hear what is going to be taught today and we can become better followers of our Lord Jesus. Now Watchman Nee says, what does the writer to the Hebrews mean when he says of the Christians that they have tasted the powers of the age to come? And if you're familiar with your Bible, you'll remember this is in Hebrews chapter 6, specifically verse 5. So what is it that, that the, the writer of the Hebrews means when he says of Christians that they have tasted of the powers of the age to come? Now, we would all readily agree that there is a splendid future age to which we look forward. In it, the kingdom that is now in the midst of us in terms of the mighty acts of the Spirit of God, will then become universally visible and unchallenged. The kingdom of the world will have become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. We're told this in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. But what we may wonder are these powers that now we only taste but cannot as yet feast upon. Clearly, they are to be received and enjoyed, for the word taste implies not merely a doctrine to be thought about and analyzed, but something subjectively experienced and made our own. These powers are the preliminaries of a feast of which there is much more to follow, but of which we already eat or taste just a little. We can list a number of such things to which Scripture looks forward. There is a salvation to be revealed in the last time. You'll find this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. There is a fresh aspect of eternal life in the age to come. Luke 18, 30. There is a rest remaining to the people of God. Hebrews 4, 9. There will be a day, hallelujah, when everything that stumbles men will be removed. You'll find this in Jeremiah 31, 9, Isaiah 57, 14, 
and Isaiah chapter 62, verse 10. There will be a time when all shall know the Lord, from the least to the greatest. Jeremiah 31, 34, and Hebrews 8, 11. And indeed, there will be a time when the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Isaiah 11, 9, Habakkuk 2, 14. And Watchman Nee failed to mention this, but I have to say it. There will be a time that every knee will bow, hallelujah, and every tongue will confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ of Nazareth, his Son, is Lord of Lords and King of Kings and the rightful owner and ruler of this earth. And that should cause all the people of God to sing hallelujah from the top of our lungs. Well, of all these things, says Watchman Nee, we have now a real foretaste in Christ. Even as I read those things, friends, you could sense the joy beaming up in your heart for what is to come for us as the children of our great God. And that's the foretaste that Watchman Nee is talking about. We can sense something better, but we haven't seen it in its fullness. And that's what he says. Of all these things, we now have a real foretaste in Christ, but we do not yet see them in their completeness. More directly related to our present study are the following considerations. The epistle to the Hebrews applies to our Lord Jesus the words from Psalm 8 which say, Thou didst put all things in subjection under his feet. And then it goes on, quite frankly, to express what experience generally must compel us to admit, namely, that we see not yet all things subjected to him, which we're reminded of in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8. But alongside these two contrasting statements, we must place also that of Jesus when he said in Luke ten nineteen that he will give his followers authority over all the power of the enemy. Surely this promises to us a present foretaste of that future day that we do not yet see. Again, in the same gospel passage, Jesus is recorded as saying, I beheld Satan falling as lightning from heaven. This event, John, in Revelation 12, 9, seems to place far in the future. Yet Jesus clearly implies that from the standpoint of the witnessing church, it is already, in some sense, a present fact. Furthermore, in a later chapter of Revelation, John is shown a day when Satan is to be bound with a chain for a thousand years. You'll find this in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 4. Yet Jesus speaks of the strong man as already being bound, so that we may even now break into his house and despoil it. Matthew 12, 29. These are significant statements for surely, if we possess salvation and eternal life in the present, as we most certainly do, then we should also be knowing some foretaste today of the rest of these future powers. For though not yet manifest universally, they are quite evidently fruits of the cross and resurrection of Christ that must be, at least in principle, the church's present possession. God's eternal purpose is bound up with man. In Genesis 126, we're told, let us make man in our image after our likeness, God said, and let them, men, have dominion. God intended man to wield power, to reign and rule, to control other created things. We cannot say that redemption was God's design, or even a part of it, for man was never intended to fall, still less to perish. Genesis chapter 3 represents man's history. 
not God's purpose for him. A workman may fall from the fifth story of a building under construction, but that was never intended in the architect's plan. No, God's plan is concerned with man's dominion. And it is well to note the special sphere of this, namely, all the earth. Heaven has no problem. The problem is on earth. Man is told to subdue the earth in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. But let us ask ourselves why. If there were no forces to be subdued, then why this need? Furthermore, we are told that the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Genesis chapter 2 verse 15. This is more than the usual Hebrew word for keep. Adam is to guard God's paradise. And again, this implies the proximity of an enemy to be kept at bay. Now, it is interesting to note the wording of Genesis 1.26. Man is to have dominion over all the earth. And the clause is expanded to cover, among other things, every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. But in the event, the first thing that man failed to control was a creeping thing, a worm. And by man's failure, Satan obtained in a new way in man himself legal rights on the earth. True, the dust of the earth was the lowly sphere appointed to him. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat, said the Lord unto the serpent. Genesis 3.14 But what is dust? It is the substance of which Adam was made. Thus man in the flesh is now morally subject to Satan. God's foe has secured a clear title to all that by natural birth man is and has. Natural human life is the foothold here on earth of Satan's activity. Satan's world springs from and finds its strength in his rights in man, and even God does not dispute these rights. He has acquired by Adam's default a full title to all that is of the old creation. So if Satan is to cease to act in us, then his ground in us must be taken from him. So God meets the situation in redemption, not by dealing with Satan directly, but as we have seen, by taking the whole of the old creation, the man himself, his world, everything, and clean it out of the way, thus removing from Satan his legal stand. Satan's overthrow is compassed not by a direct blow aimed at him, but indirectly by the removal from him in the death of Christ of all that gives him the moral right of control. Our old man, we are told in Romans chapter 6, verse 6, was crucified with Jesus, that the body of sin might be done away, so that we should no longer be in bondage to sin. Hallelujah. Praise God. Satan has therefore no longer any rights in us. But that is merely a negative fact. There is a positive one also. God has not only removed all that was in the way of his eternal purpose by removing the old creation, he has also secured all that is necessary to realize that purpose by bringing in a new creation, his new man. Again, in Romans chapter 6, verse 9, Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death no more hath dominion over him. We are new creations in Christ, hallelujah. Old things are passed away. All, A-L-L, -L, all things have become new. Now the purpose revealed in Genesis 1 
And lost in Genesis 3 is not lost for good. What God could not secure in the first man, he obtained in the second. Allow me to explain that for a moment. What God could not secure in the first man, Adam, he obtained in the second man, Jesus. And that second man, praise God, is on the throne. No wonder the New Testament writer dares to reapply the psalmist's words. When the psalmist says, What is man, that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man, that thou visitest him? and crownest him with glory and honor, Psalm 8, 4, and 5. Thus, he quotes the psalm, and then he exclaims, We behold him, even Jesus crowned, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 6 through 9. If the creation of mankind was intended to meet the need of God, that need has now at least been met. God has his man. Genesis 1, Psalm 8, and Hebrews 2 are thus uniquely linked. Psalm 8 is, of course, poetry and sings of God's plan for mankind. But the significant thing is that in spite of the fall, the singer does not deviate. He only reaffirms the original plan of Genesis 1 when he says, Thou madest him to have dominion. Psalm 8, 6. You see, it is not changed. Moreover, he not only begins, but ends his chant with the exclamation of praise. When he says in the same verse, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. The enemy has done his worst. Man has been trapped into blaspheming God. And if you or I had composed this psalm, we would surely have followed the eighth verse with a cry of distress. But alas, man has fallen and all is lost. But not so the psalmist. It is though he had forgotten the fall completely, for he does not even allude to it. He leaps in thought across the whole history of redemption, and he cries again, how excellent. Adam and Eve could fall but they could not alter God's purpose that man should eventually overthrow Satan's power through Jesus Christ our Lord. His purpose stands unaltered, and this excellence is to be known where? In all the earth. Nor is it in the Son of Man merely that this purpose is realized, but in the sons of men, those many sons, and let me just add, daughters, those many sons and daughters whom God is bringing to glory. The psalmist is at pains to underline this fact. Though the enemy do his worst, the rights he has gained through the fall have not proved inalienable. Still, among men, there are those he cannot touch. We are again told in Psalm chapter 8, verse 2, Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou established strength, because of thine adversaries, that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. God does not depend on great military leaders, and thank God for that. God depends on little children, yes, babes in Christ, these are the ones who are sufficient to quell the host of his foes. As we saw, Hebrews chapter 2 draws its inspiration from this psalm. Yet it goes a step further. While reaffirming God's purpose in creation and the goal to which it points, it does more than this. Looking back realistically over the course of fallen man's dark history, it establishes now that God's purpose in redemption and recovery is directed to the identical end. In all the new circumstances that redemption is called into being, the plan is still unchanged. God has not abandoned his goal. Moreover, from the writer's viewpoint, beyond the triumph of the cross, 
he can confidently reaffirm the psalmist's affirmation of faith. So, far from all being lost, it is true to say that in Christ, the end has been secured. Oh yes, hallelujah, it is still the same plan. He left nothing that is not subject to him. Appearances would tend to deny this, so that we see not yet all things subjected to him. Yet true as this is, the writer disregards it and at once proceeds triumphantly by saying, but we behold him who hath been made a little lower than the angels, even Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, praise God, that by the grace of God he should taste death for every man. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9. And then almost defiantly he adds that he might bring to naught the devil. Verse 14. What man was to do on earth for God and failed to do, our Lord Jesus has accomplished. We are told Jesus tasted death for everything. And as the original Greek implies, not just for every man. That is to say, it was not for man's redemption alone that he died, but for that of the whole creation. And going back further for the recovery of the Father's purpose in the complete overturning of the satanic world order. Thus it comes about that today the church has a definite responsibility before God to register the victory of Christ in the devil's territory. If there is to be a testimony to the principalities and powers, if the impact of Christ's sovereignty through his Christ is to be registered in the spiritual realm, it can only be as the judicial foothold in our hearts of the pretender in the race is met and by the same cross removed and repudiated. For God's objective is still that man should have dominion. Our work for God does not stop with proclaiming a gospel that was designed merely to undo the effect of Genesis 3. Marvelous as was that undoing. God wants also to take us back further to Genesis 1 itself. He wants us in Christ to regain the moral dominion over the foe, Satan, that was there in view, and thus effectively to restore the earth to him, to God that is. This is surely why, as Paul tells us, the earnest expectation of the creation waiteth for the revealing of the sons of God. Romans chapter 8 verse 19. The gospel of salvation is necessary and vital in order to meet man's need. But if as God's servants we are laboring only for others, we are missing God's first aim in creation, which was to apply not merely man's need, but his God's own. For as we have said already, the creation of man was to meet the need of God. Thus, if today we are going to meet God's need, we must go a step further and deal with Satan himself. We must steal back from Satan his power, evict him from his territory, spoil him of his goods, and set free his captives for God. The question is not merely of what account are we in the winning of souls, rather it is of what account are we in the realm of principalities and powers. And for that, there is a price to pay. It is often possible to move men when it is quite impossible to move Satan. The plain fact is that it costs much more to deal with Satan than to win souls. It demands an utterness of spirit Godward that in itself effectually deprives Satan of any moral ground in us he may claim to possess. This is the costly thing. God in his merciful love for the lost 
can often bypass and overlook in his servants what one might justly feel to be appalling weakness and even failure. But while he may do this for the soul winner, when it comes to our dealing with the devil, it is another matter. Evil spirits can see right through the witness of man. They can tell when it is compromised by being half-hearted or insincere. They are aware that we are holding back a part of the prize. Looking at us, they are under no illusions as to whom they can safely defy or ignore. And conversely, they know perfectly well against whom they are powerless. We are told in Acts 19.15, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, said the evil spirits, but who are you? You see, because they believe, they know when to tremble. And let me say this, since our most important task is their overthrow, it is better always that we should have the witness of evil powers than the praise of men. Let me say that again. It is better always that we should have the witness of evil powers than the praise of men. But the price of this witness to the principalities and powers is, I repeat, an utterness of allegiance to God that is unqualified. To entertain our own opinions or desires or to prefer our own variant and contrary choices is simply to present the enemy with an advantage. It is, in short, to throw the game away. In any other sphere, there may perhaps be room among our motives for something of self-interest without appreciable loss. But never, and I repeat never in this, Without such utterness for God, nothing can be achieved. For without it, we make even God powerless against his enemy. So I say it once again, the demand is very high. Are you and I here on earth utterly committed, utterly given to God himself and him alone? And because this is so, are we tasting even now the powers of that future glorious age? Are we reclaiming territory as his followers from the prince of this world, Satan, for the one Jesus who alone it rightly belongs? And that would bring us to the end of our chapter today. When we're next together, we're going to discuss more fully robbing the usurper, robbing Satan of all that he has taken from us. But today we're going to end here, and I hope that as I've read this, that as I have been, you have been inflated with the spirit, the joy, and the power of God in being reminded that we are victors in Jesus. Old things are passed away. That which is dead has been buried. And we are new creations in Christ, forever walking in the Spirit and singing constantly the praises and the joy of our Lord that belongs so rightfully unto him. Now, until we meet again, may the Lord Jesus bless your journey and may you walk in the full joy and presence of his Holy Spirit each and every moment of your life. I truly love you. And I'll see you on the next video.